Hi everyone, I'm Melanie Smith. Um, I chose a really bad day to leave my glasses at home, so I actually can't really read anything on the slides. Um, hence why I'm going to be uh, staring at my laptop a little bit, so apologies for that. Uh, if I can remember my password. Cool, yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, I've actually taken a slightly different approach to this. I'm going to take a second, well, hopefully 10 minutes uh, and no longer, to talk about uh, a case study and a piece of research that um, the company that I work for, Graphica, has been doing in a slightly different context for disinformation. So moving away slightly from the electoral interference um, studies and a bit more into kind of humanitarian context. Um, so... Graphica, if anybody has heard of it, put your hand up if you have. Yay, that's way more than I was expecting. Also, but yeah, everyone knows Camille, so that's helpful. Um, I need to change the slide. There we go. Again, can't read that, but... Um, Graphica is a social media mapping and analysis firm. Always feels like a bit of a dodgy thing to say, but uh, we're good guys, we promise. Um, we use open source data to map online ecosystems and to create network maps, some of which I'm going to show you. There's two or three in the slide, one of which spins, which I'm very excited about. Um, we were lucky enough to collaborate with the Syria campaign to provide analysis on the online disinformation that targets uh, an organization called the White Helmets. Hands up for the White Helmets. Awesome. That's really helpful too. Um, the operation against them, I'm sure most people are aware, really ramped up around the time that Russia entered the conflict in Syria in 2015. And uh, it became obvious to many actors that were involved that the White Helmets were documenting war crimes using the cameras that they have on their helmets when they go out to do rescues. Um, so for our 2017 report, we took 10 chronological periods from across 2016 and 2017 that were peaks in conversation on Twitter around the White Helmets to try and discern who were the purveyors of disinformation in this case, who were the amplifiers, and uh, what kind of narratives are they spreading. Some of these are really obvious peaks in conversation, so a documentary about the White Helmets was nominated for an Oscar. Um, that obviously created quite a big uh, Twitter chatter. Um, the Aleppo Offensive and the Nobel Peace Prize nomination that they received in 2017. So using the open Twitter API, we surfaced about 12 million tweets by around 2.65 million accounts. That obviously is a huge amount of data to try and put in a network map, and you'll see why in a minute. So we filtered that out by uh, getting rid of everybody that had mentioned or used the hashtag white helmets less than 50 times, which means that we ended up with 12,000 accounts. In theory, the most interested and the most kind of obsessed with the white helmets that we could find. Um, and the map that we created looks like that. Um, they, are, they can be a little bit tricky to read, and I realize that they're going to be even harder if you can't uh, see the labels on the slide, so hopefully I can help a bit. Um, it showed significant overlap in followership and interaction between a community that we labeled, so we have an automatic labeling process that then goes through a human analyst, in that case it was me. Um, the people in green we labeled as US left and truthers, a lot of this is alternative media and kind of conspiracy theories, these people that A, produce them and B, also share them. And that will be their kind of primary interest cluster, hence why they're colored the way that they are. So we saw significant overlap between those people and the little red slash pink dots that you can see in the corner there who uh, were determined to be Russia or Syria regime support accounts. So they are people that are either affiliated with Kremlin or the Assad regime officially, so ministries, ambassadors, official Twitter accounts of kind of state apparatus, or they're people that just push those agendas really hard. So that's kind of support in however you can define it. Um, this means that the US left, uh, the green dots, are most likely to be reached by content from the red dots. So what we're looking at there is really an audience for disinformation that's coming out of the red accounts. Um, we also found that the accounts that talked about the White Helmets most frequently were also the most influential in the map. So the people putting out disinformation are the most followed and the most listened to on social media. Obviously that creates quite a big problem. 
Um, content also benefited from inorganic amplification in many different ways. We use 24-hour uh, tweet scheduling, uh, many different ways to detect what we would determine to be uh, automatic amplification or bot-like behavior. Um, we estimated that overall disinformation content pushed by the accounts in this map reached around 56 million people. So just to let that hang for a sec. Specifically about the white helmets too. So we're talking about something very small here. Um, content analysis showed that unsurprisingly, information that was, five minutes, um, information that was uh, being put out by the Russia support group was not only focused on smearing the white helmets, but also sowing wider discontent. So this was content and narratives to do with new world order um, and support for Russian military action in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea. Um, the content originated with the people that you would probably suspect, so Kremlin-funded or owned media, Assad loyalist media, but also independent bloggers, people like Vanessa Beely and Mint Press News, who consistently put out anti-white helmets, um, for want of a better term, propaganda. Um, so we repeat, that's the spinning one. So we repeated this exercise uh, when there was a chemical attack in Duma on April 7th. We wanted to see if the community of people listening to this disinformation had changed and whether narratives have been shifted as a result specifically of this attack. So there was a new community involved. Um, the UK left, which you can see in pink when they come back around. Um, that emergence really also brought into uh, bear a lot of established European media outlets. We had people like uh, Build, uh, The Telegraph, The Times of London, and they were people that were putting out content that was uh, conspiratorial or potentially false about the White Helmets. So we're looking at a new community of users there. Um, there was also a very interesting thing that happened, which I thought was a fluke in the data collection originally, but a very large cluster of Pink Floyd fans um, because Roger Walters gave a very long tirade at a concert that he did in Barcelona about the White Helmet specifically and about why we should um, write them off as a terrorist group. So that ability to kind of game disinformation is something that we saw that was new for this map and really I think is testament to uh, the mainstreaming that is that creates a huge problem for countering disinformation. When you get an article from the Times that's saying, we're not, sure, we're not sure who the White Helmets are funded by, we think they might have um, ties to terrorist groups. That's obviously a big problem and a big audience to try and convince otherwise. Um, we also did a little bit of comparative analysis between various maps. So Amesbury in the UK and the Scruple poisoning uh, to slightly, uh, well, I don't want to say they're linked because apparently they're not, but two events that are kind of standalone and for British political uh, debate are kind of where the conversation around Russia currently is. Um, the most popular hashtag among the pro-Russia people in this map was hashtag white helmets, which when this is a map created around Amesbury seemed like a little bit of an oddity. Um, so we did a little bit of comparative analysis which showed that uh, 40% of the accounts in our map about the Scruple poisoning also engaged with disinformation around Amesbury. And I think you can probably see in the table, I can't see it, but I hope it's there. 92.6% of these total overlaps were in the anti-West pro-Russia group, which means that we've actually managed to zero in on a network of disinform disinformation actors, specifically trying to push narratives around the White Helmets. Um, efforts to distort disinformation around this attack distort information, I should say, around this attack also included um, Russian embassies, ministers, um, and kind of broadly state apparatus spreading false narratives around the White Helmets and their affiliations. Um, last one. Oh, that's really small. Um, by studying disinformation that's leveled against one group, we are kind of hoping to show how across multiple events, uh, rather than on an electoral cycle basis, we were kind of unable, we were able to uncover a different set of tactics and objectives for disinformation. And the mainstreaming of these kind of conspiratorial and false narratives by Kremlin affiliates and state apparatus has very drastic on the ground consequences for 
humanitarian organizations like the White Helmets, their centers get burnt down, their people get killed. This is a very real world issue. Um, but it also affects how communities around the world understand the geopolitics of a certain region. So how populations in China, uh, the US, Australia, conceptualize what's happening in Syria and who the main actors involved are. So the objective of this type of coordinated and sustained disinformation is not about interference in a singular democratic process, but is to undermine democracy as it fundamentally stands. This is about protection of civilian populations and trying to subvert those efforts. Thank you. Okay.